This video will show the restoration of a Heathkit AR-29 stereo receiver. At the time this was built, 1970, the AR-29 was second to top of the line, the AR-15 being the top model of Heathkit. A little history about this unit. Uh, it was built by myself and my father in 1970. It was used for many years and for the past two decades it had been stored. On October 29, 2012, Superstorm Stan Sandy flooded my parents' home and this receiver came within inches of going into the ocean. The original Heathkit speakers did not make it, they went, uh, they went into water. After the storm, the unit sat in a damp, unheated room for two weeks. Not a good way to store electronics. I took it home and after a year tried it. The unit worked, but one channel was weak and the sound quality was not as good as I had remembered. After some research, I learned that the electrolytic capacitors usually last about 10 to 20 years. Uh, these are 44 years old, and I suspected that's the problem, and we'll see. Heathkit, which is now out of business, was an electronic kit company which had its heyday in the 1960s and 70s. This was the first of many electronic kits that we built we built their mini bike before this, but that's another story. Heathkit would ship all of the parts needed. You only had to have a soldering iron and a few basic hand tools. What made their kits fantastic was, was two things. Their legendary assembly manual and the way they packed the, the parts for the kits. The original assembly manual was lost, but I was able to purchase a reproduction online. Here's a sample of some of the circuit board assembly instructions. You can see the detail, uh, the level of detail that Heathkit used in these instructions. Here's some chassis assembly instructions, even even detail on how to how to strip wire. There's also, if you notice, little check boxes where each task was checked off, so you didn't uh, forget where you were or you didn't skip a step. I suspect this came from the military. In the 60s and 70s, there was probably a lot of World War II veterans and uh, ex-defense contractor employees in the workforce. Here's an inside look at the chassis. The first thing that I noticed is the uh, heavy 063 aluminum construction of the chassis. You don't see that anymore on the plastic junk that we have. Um, the unit was, const was constructed with separate circuit boards for each function. This is the AM, FM, IF board. Behind it is the multiplex board. There's two identical power output circuit boards. The power transformer, AM, uh, RF board on top of the tuner. And all, almost all the boards come out. And they, they simply snap out just like this. And this, is, this was to make the assembly easier. Here we have one of the boards removed the AM, FM, R, uh, R, IF board, and this will make it very easy to replace components. Just simply turn it over and remove the solder. Soldering uh, connections for the most part look pretty good. Um, not bad for a 10 year old. And Here's a view of the bottom of the unit. Uh, this is the input preamp board and the power supply board. There's two uh, red stickers on the side of the chassis, and these indicate that the uh, receiver went to a Heathkit service center twice. Uh, the first one is in 1970, and I do remember that. When we fired up the, uh, the receiver the first time, it worked, but the stereo light would not come on, and uh, could not figure it out. This was all new to us. Uh, we took it to Heathkit service center, and what they found was that integrated circuit uh, which is right in the middle of the screen, one pin was not touching its uh, its socket, and that caused the um, stereo not to function right. That was an integrated circuit. It probably had a handful of transistors. Um, today they have millions in a, in a chip, but that was state-of-the-art for 1970. These two power amp boards uh, are identical, um, but it, although, it, although it does appear that the capacitors were replaced and a couple other components look newer, uh, it's, don't remember when that was done or who did that, but uh, we're going to change those capacitors anyway. 
overall this chassis looks pretty good um, there's there's some dust on it and some of these components have like a almost like a little corrosion on them uh, so we'll put uh, we'll, we'll clean that up with the air and we'll put the oxide on these pin connections and um, and then we'll uh, we'll see how it goes some of the uh, hardware has like almost an electrolysis residue on it. Uh, it seems to be where the steel touches aluminum. There's this white corrosion and uh, of course we'll clean that off too. I cleaned up the circuit boards using this uh, dust remover spray and uh, they cleaned up nicely. I replaced all the electrolytic capacitors. There was a total of 42 and uh, these boards are, are ready to be installed. I also used uh, spray deoxid on these sliders, which are the volume, treble, um, and base controls. The capacitors I used are uh, Vichy Sprague. Uh, that's a good brand capacitor. There's a lot of uh, talk on the internet and other places about audio grade, so-called audio grade capacitors. and. Um, I consulted a friend of mine who's an electrical engineer and basically this is a lot of sales hype. Uh, a good capacitor is a good capacitor. Uh, if you put a more expensive capacitor in, it's not going to make the uh, receiver sound any better than it ever did. Um, so I went with uh, Vichy Sprague. I used this solder removal tool to um, unsolder the components. They, they work very well. The only thing you have to be aware of is that that, that uh, bulb moving air across the tip uh, cools the tip a bit. So as long as you're aware of that, it, it works fine. It does remove the solder quickly and uh, with, with uh, minimal heat. I cleaned, the, um, I cleaned the plugs with the oxit liquid, and I found out that this, uh, this is a dental, hy dental hygiene brush. And that, that worked out very well. It fit right into the uh, it fit right into these little plugs that uh, allow the, the circuit boards to plug into the chassis. I cleaned the um, male chassis plugs with deoxid. Also, cleaned the chassis with uh, denatured alcohol and some more compressed air, and it cleaned up nicely. I replaced all the uh, bulbs on the front panel. I used regular um, incandescents. They lasted. Some of them were still working after 44 years, so I saw no reason to put LEDs in. And the chassis is, is re now ready for the circuit boards. I noticed the dial pointer was rusty because it's a piece of steel wire. I just simply painted that. I sanded a little bit and painted it with model paint, flat black, and that's also ready to be installed. I cleaned the uh, the tuning knob and some of the push buttons with uh, just dishwasher soap and water and rinse them off and dried them and they were fine. They're ready to go also. Since I have all of the uh, resistance test measurements and the uh, voltage uh, readings, I'm going to do this. I'm not going to just slap the circuit boards in. I'm going to test each board as it goes in and then do the voltage tests. In this receiver, the signal meter has a dual function as a uh, ohm meter and a voltmeter, and that was used to do the initial tests of the uh, circuit boards and the chassis when it was first started up. These switches switched the signal meter from from uh, normal operation to test, and from uh, ohm meter to voltmeter. Very simple circuitry. It's very clever engineering to do that. The multiplex board has a built-in uh, signal generator for some of the alignments and these two switches here are activated uh, for the alignment procedures and then they get back to normal when you're done and, uh, and they do not need to have any special instruments to align this. I ran into a bit of a delay because I did not have a, an alignment tool for these coils. These uh, tall ones actually have two cores, a tall, an upper one and a lower one, and what you have to do is have a special alignment tool that's neck down. Uh, I don't know if you can see it on the video, but it, it gets smaller as you get away from the tip. And you go through the top, 
you go through the top core and you drop it into the um, into the coil and then you go past it if you have to reach the bottom core. Uh, I could not find this anywhere locally. At the end of the video I'll explain where this came from. It's actually pretty incredible. The center coil on the RF board, um, the core jammed um, and I didn't want to break it because it's it's brittle. So uh, it sounded good, the AM alignment went well, and I decided just to leave it alone. Uh, if I break it, I don't know if I'd be able to replace it. So for now, it's going to stay just the way it is. Okay, the, uh, the uh, receiver's running right now, uh, but we have a little problem that cropped up after it was in its cabinet. And what happened is the uh, stereo light was on all the time. You can't see it now. It's off. I traced that to a, a bad integrated circuit, which I replaced. This little circuit, uh, this little 14 pin um, IC in there. Took a while to get, it was very expensive. When I put it in, it worked for a while, and then I have no stereo separation. I have one, the left signal is strong, the right speaker is low, and no stereo indicator light, as you can see here. And what I noticed is that it's actually loose and if I just touch it I can get the light I can get the light to come on and I'm just touching it with my finger so we have uh, to just take care of those pins I'm gonna bend them a little bit and uh, just make it a more secure connection there that socket is actually not a, a singular socket it's 14 separate little sockets that are um, soldered in there and each pin has to align with them so uh, just not an efficient way to do it but anyway I'm gonna try bending the pins out a little bit so it's a little tighter fit and see if that keeps the uh, stereo uh, on One of the good things about this receiver is the boards all snap out and in. So to do something like this <coughs> um, on a heath kit is actually very easy because you can take the board out and do it on your bench. I'm now going to put the board in. And it worked. We have stereo separation, so now it's time to put it back in the cabinet. It earlier stated that there was a slight delay in uh, finding the proper alignment tool. I'm now going to show you where I got this original heat kit alignment tool. As I was wondering what my next project would be, I searched the words unbuilt heat kit and lo and behold I found the exact same receiver unbuilt for sale. And that will be the next project and the subject of the next video. It's from 1970. It, it was the original owner. Uh, I bought it from his son. The owner passed away. And the son had no interest in building it. And as you can see, it's right out of the box. It's unbuilt. This is an extremely rare find. And um, I got it for um, a very small amount of money, believe it or not. It was about to go on eBay, where the price would have... Um, would have been jacked way months ago, and uh, look forward to building it in the, in the next uh, in the next coming months. Well, I hope you enjoyed watching the restoration of the Heathkit AR29 receiver. Uh, I had an enjoyable time doing the restoration for me since I built this as a child. It was actually a time capsule, and um, I look forward to building the new one with my son. See you next time. Thank you.